Professor Mukunda, we're here to talk about your book, Indispensable, When Leaders Really Matter. I just want to say uh, this was a delightful book to read. Uh, you, you deal with some very familiar figures, but you found new things to say about them, and you've attacked them from some new angles. So let's dive in. Uh, you have one of your epigrams. Is a, is a quote that uh, gets attributed to different people. I gather Charles de Gaulle is most often uh, credited with it. Yeah. The graveyards are full of indispensable men. What does that mean? So I think, sort of appropriately for something de Gaulle would say, it has a dual meaning. That people call themselves indispensable or think of themselves indispensable, and they can't be because life goes on when they die. All, me all men do. But at the same time, the, so that, that's the surface meaning, and I think it's, it's the major one that he wanted to poke a little bit at the ego of both himself and many of his colleagues who thought themselves the world would end when they did. But at the same time, I think it is a subtle reminder that there are people in history who, around whom you could almost say fate seems to hinge, that without them, events would have been very different. And although that's not, in most of academia, a very fashionable thing to say, I think most historians would agree that there are indispensable individuals but that doesn't, that, that's essentially a matter of context. They were indispensable at that moment, in that place, in that time. And in other ones, they wouldn't have been at all. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and, and you do then go on to say that this is a, a controversial notion among historians and philosophers. And you have, uh, I guess, the two teams you cite are, are Plato and Karl Marx yeah. saying that this is not the case. And then Thucydides and uh, um, Carlyle. And Carlyle saying that it is. So t tell us what, how they locked horns over this. So this, is the, this has to be one of the oldest debates in thinking about, hu about history or social, or social science. It, it's a debate that pre predates even the idea, the idea that there is such a thing as social science. Mm -hmm. But if you go back to sort of Plato or you know, later from Marx, it's the idea that social forces are what really explain human outcomes. If the, na if the people were there, were just different people, if they had died of a heart attack and were replaced by someone else, what happened, the stuff that really mattered, would have ended up being about the same. So Marx famously makes this argument, the 18th Brumaire of Louis Napoleon. But in the essay, which is you know, in theory about Louis Napoleon's rise to power, he barely mentions Louis Napoleon. It's not about him at all. It's all about the class struggle or the social forces. And so this it, it essentially is, to quote Dick Samuels from MIT, has become a, a, a history or political science without proper nouns. No people involved, all larger struggles. On the other hand, Carlyle takes the most extreme opposite position, right? He says that history is nothing but the biographies of great men. Mm -hmm. And so, and this is easily caricatured as the great man theory of history. That's just one person after another after another, and it's all about biography. And I'd strike, what I thought was that these are two fundamentally incompatible viewpoints, right? You cannot get further apart in your view of the world than these two. But the problem is that both arguments make sense. The social scientists or the people following in the tradition of, uh, of uh, you know, not just Marx, but most, so most, social sci most social scientists say basically, look, there are three reasons why leaders don't actually matter that much. That the leader of any organization faces external constraints. If you're the CEO of a company, you have competitors, so you can't set your price at whatever you want. Mm -hmm. They have internal constraints. There are bureaucratic politics and tradition and culture and all the things that happen inside a country, inside a company, inside a military unit. So you can't do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. And maybe most importantly, leaders aren't chosen randomly. So most leaders of powerful organizations, organizations that we care about, organizations that really do have the ability to sort of reshape history, they're not picked out of a hat. They're picked because that organization is looking for someone with some set of characteristics. And you call that the leadership filtration process. That's right. I think every organization has some sort of a process, because very few, if any, modern organizations are just going to pick people randomly. And this includes countries. This includes countries, companies, even I, would, even I think, if you look at it in the right way, even the sciences, which aren't an organization at all, but they still have filtration processes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, countries, we, if we looked at this pre the most recent presidential election in the United States, there was something, as you went through the Republican primaries, that people were saying, well, it's not this person. It's not uh, Tim Pawlenty drops out right after the Iowa caucuses, and then Michelle Bachman drops out, and uh, Newt Gingrich drops out, and eventually Rick Sanchez, and you're left with, one, with sort of a last person standing. But most often, it's not about picking a winner. It's about picking losers. It, this is not the person. This is not the person. Mm -hmm. This is not the person. And finally, you get a last person standing. A process of elimination. A exactly, a process of elimination. Which is consistent 
in in whatever organization it is so it tends that, to be I think it is in the sense that that's a, that's a platonic ideal it's a simplified version of, of reality that I think you use to build theory theories start with simple and then you bec you make them more complex but if you take say GE so GE is famous for the way it chooses leaders GE we always we always tell our students GE is a company that works in practice but not in theory because it doesn't seem to do any of the things we say it should do, mm -hmm. but it's, it's incredibly profitable and incredibly successful. And if you had to pick GE's core competency, it seems to be that it's good at picking leaders. It's good at developing managers, at training managers, and at picking the right people. And so GE spends 20 years selecting among all of the people in the organization and slowly promoting them and evaluating them over and over and over again. And so at the end of the day, say 20, you know, 20 years, it doesn't bring in anyone from outside. You have to work your way up. At the end of the day, you get five finalists, say, who all, and the CEO picks one person from those five finalists. But when I think, if you think of those five finalists, I say you should think about two things about them. The first one is, well, they're prob all probably very good at their job because they made it all the way to the top of GE. Mm -hmm. They made it all the way to the top of a company that's been successful for 100 years. Mm -hmm. So they're pretty close to what GE is looking for. And there's one thing you can be sure GE is looking for. It's a good manager. But the other thing you should probably believe about them, for the exact same reasons, is that it doesn't really matter which one of them gets picked. Obviously, it matters to them. But from the perspective, say, of a GE shareholder, well, there are five people who made their way to the top of GE. How different could they possibly be? They've all passed through this 20-year-long leader filtration process. And you have a name for leaders who emerge in that way. That's as right. As a class. And what, what is that? So I call those leaders modal. This idea is that there are many people who could become the leader, that if you could rerun history a million times, you wouldn't get the same person over and over again. You get random factors. So if you think about the presidential election in 2000, right? George W. Bush becomes the president of the United States, at least in part because of the ballot design in Florida and the weather in the mm -hmm. Florida panhandle. So I can't think of anything more random than the weather in Florida. So random effects obviously have an impact. So if you run history a million times, those random events make different people win different, have different likelihoods of winning. Maybe if you could run that election a million times, you get George W. Bush 400,000 times and Al Gore 400,000 times and John McCain 100,000 mm -hmm. times, right? Mm -hmm. So you have lots of different people. So I say that people who are at the center of the distribution, people who are really likely to win, people who have been thoroughly evaluated, thoroughly filtered by the process. So another, another way I describe them as filtered leaders. Mm -hmm. They're very similar. They have a lot in common with each other. But if you can get power, somehow by bypassing the process. So something happens so the leader filtration process isn't able to thoroughly evaluate you. And in the evaluation process, recognize that you are not what it is looking for, for whatever reason, and stop you from gaining power. Then those people, I call them unfiltered, can be on the extreme of that distribution of people who might possibly gain power. And so, so these people are not stopped, even though the deck is stacked against them. That's exactly it, yeah. Ran luck, ca luck counts, random events count. Or sometimes the deck might, might, might not be stacked against them, but the evaluation process can't be triggered. If you inherit control of your company, you're not evaluated, mm -hmm. you're inherited. Mm -hmm. So the evaluation never kicks in, even if people n know that you're gonna do a bad job. Right, so, so we have uh, in the leadership filtration process, we have the modal leaders, and then sometimes we have the extreme leaders. That's right. Now you have two, um, sets of leaders that you look at in great detail. One of them is the presidents of the United States. The other is, is the prime ministers of uh, Great Britain since 1832 when the rules uh, changed. So let's, uh, let's start with the presidents. Why did you pick the presidency as a case study? So there were a bunch of reasons. One is importance. I think mm -hmm. when you're doing... It sells books. <laughs> it sells books, certainly. I certainly hope it does. We recognize these, these, these guys. <laughs> but even more than that, right? I think that I think part of our, our job is... Uh, I'm, an, I'm an academic. Part of my job as an academic is to answer questions that matter, that really have an impact in the world. So we conventionally describe the President of the United States as the most powerful person in the world. I think that's, that's probably true. That's a fair description. So surely if I can do something to contribute to our understanding of how we pick these people and how we can pick them better, that's a great idea. So just all by itself, you should, you should, I think you should, it's sort of an obligation to look at important issues, mm -hmm. issues that matter. But beyond that, the presidency is sort of a perfect test case for a bunch of reasons. One is just data. The American government historically is so wonderfully transparent and so carefully chronicled 
that you can get information, not just about every president, but about every person who almost became president. Mm -hmm. And you can get 